Okay, uh, hello guys, uh, welcome to the, the last talk of the day. Also the last talk of the DEFCON 18. Well, uh, I'm Benson and this is uh, Jeremy. Uh, we actually are very surprised that you guys are still here. Uh, you guys didn't, you know, uh, get passed out uh, from last night, crazy uh, Saturday night. Uh, actually, uh, the talk is about a uh, malware analysis. Uh, we first will introduce uh, some very famous malware instance that we have collected and then uh, we will uh, explain how these malware try to uh, fight against uh, anti-malware solutions. And then we propose a method that we call uh, malware runtime forensics that we try to uh, analyze these uh, forensic data on these malwares and then we try to do automatic clustering that help us to identify who is who after all. So as I have introduced, uh, I'm Benson and then it's Jeremy and then uh, another speaker when actually went back to Santa Clara with our, uh, one of our colleagues. Uh, he actually got so sick on the last day. So uh, Wen was not here. First of all, uh, we actually would like to uh, introduce some Chinese characters. Actually, uh, the character on the uh, upper uh, left corner is actually represents uh, the term malicious in Chinese. And then the first uh, malware sample that we're going to introduce here is actually uh, one of the malicious malware that is very famous called Sharps Theater. It actually help you generate programs that you can steal username and password from uh, these famous common well known applications such as Internet Explorer, uh, MSN Messengers or uh, your uh, Firefox. So it's, it's more like a malware generator. The next one is called BFrost. This one is also very famous. It's a very famous uh, bot uh, malware. As you can see uh, on this uh, CNC console, it actually has 28 users connected back to this CNC console. So there are 28 victims. And then the one you see up here, it's a, it's a Chinese version. Uh, it actually derived from the BFrost and uh, it originally derived uh, from BFrost by uh, Chinese hackers and then uh, these characters, uh, if you notice that uh, it's in traditional Chinese rather than simplified Chinese, so uh, got localized by Taiwanese hackers. And then uh, the, the block you see here, it, you can specify where is your CNC console and then whether you want to pack the uh, resulting malware or not. You can also specify if you want to add more plugins such as keyloggers, so on and so forth. So it makes uh, generating a malware that help you steal, uh, that make you uh, infect, infect uh, victims to be a bot very easily. And then the second phrase we're going to introduce in the talk is called lo ji. Uh, lo ji. This one represents chicken. While in DEFCOM you see that the, the war of sheep, well in Chinese hacker community they, they don't call it sheep, they call it chicken. So you actually see a farm of chicken instead of war of sheep. And this is the, the war, uh, the farm of chicken. Yeah, so obviously you know where, where it came from, right? In the, in the world of sheep, we only show a username and password in DEFCOM, but in the form of chicken, you get to see victim's face through the webcam. Okay, and then the modern advanced malware are so powerful that they have so many advanced features. These features including anti blah 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 features such as antivirus, uh, going against anti uh, antivirus, going against your firewall, uh, and then going against your hips. And then it has more features if you are willing to pay more. 
So if you pay more, you get to enjoy more features that you can put into your uh, malware that you generated. So it's more like a malware as a service in this community. So you can see some uh, features such as, uh, so in addition to antivirus, uh, fighting against uh, antivirus, fighting against firewall, fighting against the heaps, you also have an anti uh, VMware, anti debugger, uh, anti API hookings. So these are the features that once you pay more, you can enjoy. So now we will also talk about uh, how they fight against the sandboxing environment. How they can detect whether they are in the sandboxing environment or not. Uh, these are the approaches that they, they use. Uh, the first one is how they can detect whether they are inside a VM or emulator environment. Usually uh, one approach is that they, they would uh, try to check the, the base address for these IDT and LDT because in, in a normal machine, the IDT and LDT address starts with A something. If it's not starting with this address, then it's probably in a VM environment. And they can also check for the devices because these devices in the VM environment or emulators, for example, the CPU IDs tends to be very unique. The model name tends to be very unique. They also have a very specific PCI device. So if they check against these special hardware specifications, they can recognize whether they are in the VM environment or emulator. And after all, they can also try to launch these backdoor commands because these undocumented backdoor commands are only available when you are inside an emulated environment. So it's very easy for malware to recognize whether they are in a VM environment or emulator. And then in addition to VM emulator detection, they can also check whether they are in a sandboxing Windows environment or not. Because in a sandboxing Windows environment, you tend to have specific service, you tend to have a specific process name. So they can try to check whether these specific process or specific service name are there or not. Also, they can also try to detect these uh, kernel mode SSDT or the user mode API hooking is presented or not. And then after all, uh, the last one is a very trivial one but works very effectively. They actually have a list of uh, legitimate Windows production ID because uh, these vendors, they, ha they have to have legal license of their Windows. So they have a limited set. And this limited set are being collected by hackers community so they know whether they are inside the sandbox or not simply by checking against these legitimate license. So we have introduced how modern malware try to detect whether they are in the sandbox, VM, emulating environment or not. And then what's even more is that uh, they can also try to defeat you even when you try to have monitors, even when you try to hook and then try to detect them. So what they can do is that they can restore the SSDT hook they can also unload the notified routine or process of thread or image or registry. They can also unload this file system filter, restore the FSD hook, unload the TDI filter which is for networking, and they can also remove uh, these NTFS attached device. So you can see there are a lot of things they can do, try to unhook you and then try to neutralize your monitors. And then after all, there are also some uh, HIPs. They try to implement their protection layer on the file system level. However, these modern malware, they can also try to launch direct raw DIX access through the DIX.SYS. Then they can bypass your file system protection. So what we try to propose in our talk is actually a behavior analysis and then we try to do forensics. Uh, there are two approaches for behavior analysis. The one is called a network-based approach, which we'll not address in our talk because the approach that we take is actually a whole space. 
So uh, for host space approach, we already mentioned, you either use a VM, you use a sandbox, but as you already know, malware can defeat it these very easily. So what we do is actually use a host space runtime forensics. So in our runtime forensics, what we did is that uh, we let the malware execute it. And then we try to do forensics after it's already executed. So we collect a snapshot of the environment and then we try to identify the special, special features in that environment. And because we already let the malware execute, we don't have to have monitors to see what happened to the malware during its executions. We also don't have to do hookings either to, through the API or not. So we have nothing for the malware to, be, to defeat us. So you might be wondering, so what kind of features do we try to get uh, when we study this snapshot of an environment? There are three aspects of features that we try to collect, we try to analyze. The first one would be the installation re remnants. These are the, the installation files after the malware try to execute on the system. They either could be startup files, they either could be uh, additional registered keys, we also study the memory layout, try to find some memory block over suspicious DLLs. And then we also try to find if there are suspicious malicious behavior inside the systems, for example, a hidden process, a hidden files. So these are all the symptoms for malicious behavior where a legitimate software would not uh, exhibit on your system normally. And then among the three aspects, uh, we would uh, further explain the one how we study memory layout because this one is the most hardest one to work with. So how we study the memory layout, first we have to, we have to identify which process is suspicious. So the way we identify this one is we first will fetch the process and service list and then we compare against the list the, the process list that is already inside the system. And we find a difference between these two lists. And then how we, we fetch the process including we scan all the following tables as you can see up here on the slides. And then by doing this, we already identify the hidden process. We already identify the process that is very suspicious. Then we have to further dig into, we have to find which part of this process has the suspicious uh, DLLs. So we, we will fetch the DLLs from the LDR and then we analyze the memory layout, also its structures, scan the code block, I try to find the, the, the code blocks that is, uh, that is, which we'll explain later, how we, we do this part to find the suspicious DLL. So what you see on, on the graph, normally a process will involve a lot of DLLs where they are implicitly linked. But if there is a DLL that is explicitly linked, it's very likely that it's a suspicious DLL. And that is how we identify a suspicious DLL. So that's what we, we call, uh, we check the LDR and then we scan the import table, try to find the suspicious DLL. On the other hand, if the, if the process actually does not load uh, a DL at runtime, time, it actually uh, do some code injection instead. Then our approach is that we will search the memory, try to find the suspicious uh, P image. So uh, in this flow chart, you can see that, uh, so let's review. We, we try to identify suspicious process and then we try to identify suspicious DL. And then inside this suspicious DL, we do our runtime forensics, which includes LDR scan, PE packer signature check-in, code disassembly, string extraction, and then file inspection for hidden files. So these are the, the action items that we do for runtime forensics once we already identify, identify the suspicious memory layout. And then uh, in the following slides, we will introduce some examples that we have collected in the wild 
that uh, use all these kind of uh, anti anti uh, malware techniques. The first one would be the B frost. You already seen in the previous slides. Uh, this one is a very famous bot that being used in Chinese hacker community. And its Chinese name is called uh, Rainbow Bridge. And the, the phrase is actually from its icon being used. So you can see the icon is a rainbow bridge. So that's its Chinese name. And this B frost, uh, it, uh, it uses uh, code injection. So it's not DL injection, it uses code injection. So the only way you can find this uh, suspicious uh, uh, code injection, you have to scan the memory and then try to find the P image. And then you will notice that it, it tried to do code injection into the IE browser, into IE browser. And then it will access a series of uh, URLs. And the first one, if you notice that, the first one it tried to access is uh, Microsoft.com. It actually tried to check if the network connectivity is available or not. And then it tried to access some uh, CNC servers. These CNC servers are actually uh, named after Chinese vocabularies. For example, the one that we highlighted is actually called uh, uh, may I know, you know, you ask a question, may I know, the phrase is called Qing Wen, may I know? Case number two is also a very famous one in Chinese hacker community, it's called GhostNet. Uh, the or original official report is actually released by Canadian uh, researchers, uh, Shadows in the Cloud. Uh, and then uh, from the sample you can see that uh, uh, it tried to do, it tried to uh, install itself as a, a system DL file into the system. And then it will connect to a CNC server. When we try to reverse uh, this binary, we also identify the botnet commands that it can use. So you, you see all these botnet commands that this uh, ghost net can use. Uh, notice that this ghost net has nothing to do with the uh, ghost rat uh, malware. And then the string at the bottom, uh, it's, uh, it's how we find out uh, its original project name on that uh, malware uh, author's computer. It's actually called uh, CXP. So it's the original project name before uh, this malware being uh, compiled. Okay. And uh, the URL that we mark is actually one of the CNC uh, servers that this uh, malware sample try to connect to. And this uh, CNC server is also being mentioned in the shadow in the cloud report. The case number three is uh, dfn666.net uh, samples that we collected a uh, few months ago through the mass SQL injection attack that have been launched uh, recently, starting March. And uh, these uh, massive SQL injection attack, uh, these malware will use a uh, shell execute, uh, execute a hook, meaning that it will affect your exporter so that uh, uh, once you get infected, it will try to connect to all these online games and then try to uh, steal your username and password for these online games. We have a very detailed story about this uh, massive SQL in injection on our blog. And this one is still ongoing nowadays. So even though the, its first experience are, are back in March and it's still uh, ongoing. So the last one would be the Zeus bot. It's also another malware that we study. And uh, this one is a, a very famous one as well. Uh, you can see that uh, it's actually try to use the win log on notify, so through the register key, and then it will infect every process you have on the system, and then it will connect to a CNC server. Then you will become a bot. The Zeus bot is so famous that it, it even has its, its wiki page, and one of the security vendor even named it called the king of bots, 
Its planet size is kind of like a 3.6 million. So now we will go into how we do malware clustering because we already know so much about malware and then we, we know how to study them, we know how to do forensics on them, we know all their techniques. Then how, how do we do clustering? And then you might ask, you know, why do you have to do clustering? You already know it's a malware. So the reason behind this is very obvious. Then you can group those that are alike together. So the way we do malware clustering is we try to compute the similarity between these malware instances. And so our final result, we will have to come up with a similarity matrix, which is a score that indicates how similar any two instances are, are compared between each other. So we will build a similarity matrix of the malware samples that we collected. So among the test sets that we have, it's, a, it's more than 400 malware samples. We do forensic reports on all these malware samples. And then we try to extract the three significant features that we just uh, mentioned. Installation remnants, memory layout, and suspicious malware behaviors. And then all these features, they will have a, a score. They will have a score. And then for every malware that have this score, it will compare against another malware instance. And then you can get a similarity. And then we compare with every malware instance, you get a vector of similarities. And then finally, you get a, a matrix of similarities. And this is how we come up with the matrix after all. And then we automate this process through our tool called ZeroBox. So ZeroBox will scan all the malware samples that we have, make, make it execute, and then study it get a report and then come up with the matrix and then do the clustering. And then you will be able to group into different groups. Uh, in our test samples, uh, we actually have 408 malware samples that we collected uh, on the July on, on the 8th of July this year. Uh, because we have, a, we have a, a product called HackAlert that can scan websites for Trojans that are already on that website and then we collect all these malware samples. And then uh, we also test against these malware samples on some uh, existing antivirus and the hit rate is not that really good. Uh, some vendors have less than 20%, some vendors can have 50%. So these malware are really new. And how we do the clustering is through the k-means clustering. But we will not get into too much details on why we choose this one. But uh, the, the clustering uh, mechanism we use is k-means clustering. And you see the similarity matrix and you see a lot of colors. The reason that it has a lot of colors is because we, we uh, model these scores into RGBs because we, we want to visualize it. Uh, humans ha uh, has more feelings with visual, uh, pictures, so we try to visualize it. And then if you look at the first block, uh, you see some patterns that are alike. Maybe you don't but we will get into that. So this is the first block, okay? Did you see any color patterns? Definitely you see a lot of color patterns, but actually there are some blocks that differentiate from uh, other blocks. So for example, if you look at the, the second line, you see the upper corner, there's some gray, gray colors, and then you see it becomes a little pink 
over the skin color, and then it becomes more purple, and then becomes uh, more like a pale white again. So it seems that you can see four blocks within this big block. Okay, so uh, simply by visualizing it, you already can group these colors into four blocks. I hope that you guys are not feeling dizzy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and actually every line, as we mentioned, it's a, it's a similarity vector how these malware instance compare against other malware instance. So every line represents a malware instance. And then we use the antivirus to double check whether it's a, a malware or not. And you can see all these malware uh, different namings used by these antivirus vendors. And then all these malware instance happen to be the same malware family, cozy bot, Zeus bot. So even for the, the first uh, upper block, it's, it's all Z bot. And then even the second block, it's all Z bot. So a total of all these are uh, 26, these are all Z bot instance. And because there are some Zbot variants, uh, instead of only believing in these antivirus, we actually try to do manual inspection by our own. We try to double check these are really Z uh, Zbot uh, malware instance, and then we try to find their versions so that we can tell uh, which variants they are. And there are actually some different uh, bot command in these uh, different Zbot binaries. So you can tell there are different versions. So for version one, it has these commands. For version two, it has uh, another set of commands. So after our manual inspection, we are able to identify different Zbot variants. So the upper three blocks all belong to, all belongs to version two. Z bots, and then the the one on the on the bottom are actually uh, Z bot version one. So uh, based on our experimental results, you see that out of four hundred and eight malware instance, uh, we manually identify there are fifty two Z bot malware instance. And then among these 52 malware instance, Zbot malware instance, they can be clustered into four groups. One group is V1 variant, and then three groups are V2 variants. When we compare these uh, clustering results against antivirus results, they, are, they actually match with each other. So our malware clustering uh, have uh, the, the, the same accuracy as the antivirus while uh, these antivirus tools, they are only able to identify 26 of them. While we can automatically cluster the all, the all uh, 52 uh, instance. So even though we don't have signatures, because we know how to cluster them, their colors tend to be similar. Their colors tend to be similar. Then we are able to say that, okay, these malware binary are actually a Zbot family. And then uh, in that big uh, block, we only look at the first block, right? So there are other blocks in that uh, pictures. There are also other malware families, including the, the Undo families and also the, the Bagel families, also a very famous uh, malware. So these, these malware instances, they also tend to be very similar. They have the same color patterns. So uh, the conclusion is that, uh, as you can see, the traditional, uh, the traditional uh, hooking-based monitor approach already cannot uh, 
handle the modern advanced malwares because these modern advanced malwares they know how to do a lot of anti uh, anti uh, malware techniques including uh, a lot of techniques we mentioned in previous slides. So instead our approach is to do forensics after the malware already has been executed. So we only need a snapshot of the environment. And the experimental results also justify that because, our, because of our runtime forensics we are able to collect a lot of significant features. These significant features help us to do automatic clustering of malware. So it also helps us to identify even unknown malwares because we are able to cluster them into the groups that they are more alike with. So uh, that will end our talk. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you actually can also uh, write, write emails to us. Yeah, so surprisingly actually a normal PC. Yeah. But is it something that like this is a production PC that has whatever software on it, you can just load the uh you would get all the patches after you infected the power? Yes. And how how long does it take to do that type of and presumably it connects to your back end, like it collects its evidence and sends it out to your back end for Yeah. On average uh, we try to limit that into less than thirty minutes. Yeah, uh, so uh, he actually asked whether we use a normal PC or not or an emulated environment. Our answer is that we use a regular PC because as we mentioned there are so many anti-VM, anti-emulator techniques malware can use. And normally uh, for us to restart all these regular PC boot up until we finish all these forensics, it takes less than 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so we're taking a snapshot uh, after the malware already executed, we try to execute our, our binary. So we try to launch our program. So then uh, after we launch our program, we will look for all those three significant features we mentioned. So we studied this uh, startup keys, all these uh, installation files, all these memory layouts, and all these uh, suspicious behaviors. Yeah. It's still on a, a very early stage of prototype. Yeah, and we tr we try to make it more mature so that uh, we can release to the community. Yes. Yeah. And then we have, that's why we have to uh, restart it. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, it's possible. This is why uh, all these kind of forensic tools, they, they have to stay anonymous so that they cannot be, become one of the blacklist. Yeah, once you make it into a product, then they will try to stop you right away when you try to install it. Yes? Yes, definitely, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we will try to make it public because uh, we are still in a rush to finalize in it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And then uh, if you have any feedbacks, uh, we welcome you to write us. Thank you. Uh, see you, DEF CON 19.